All right, so we are getting started. Welcome to everybody who is tuning in for another EBFA webinar. Uh, always very appreciative of everyone's support for taking their time uh, to tune in, especially live. And if you are tuning in recorded or in the archive version, very special welcome to you as well. So a very exciting webinar that we have today. We actually have a sponsor, which means that you have a chance to win something for free, which is always fun. Um, today's webinar is going to take a little bit different look from a lot of other EBFA education and webinars, which is always heavy from the ground up focused. We're actually going to take a little look at the proximal uh, lumbo pelvic hip complex and what is happening in that region of the body as far as gait. Before we get started, a few housekeeping is all of our webinars are recorded, they're archived, and they can be found on our YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com backslash EBFA Fitness. And there you will find this webinar as well as probably by now, I don't know, 50, 60 plus webinars that we've done over the past uh, three, four, five years. So plenty of great free education. Um, because we are doing a uh, sponsorship raffle, that means that I will be asking you a question, two questions to win these uh, raffle prize, which means that you need to know where the questions box is on your control panel. So if you look to the control panel, you will see that if you scroll down, you will see where it says questions, oops, and that is where you can type in your answer after I answer, ask you that question. Uh, if you want a recording, or not the recording, the PDF of this PowerPoint, please know at the end that you can email me at education at ebfafitness.com and I will send you the PDF so you can reference back at that. Um, and I will, of course, gladly send you any references if you want to look back at those as well and do a little bit more exploration. So we're going to get started. Real quick, I'm going to introduce myself for those who are tuning in for the first time and may not be familiar with who I am uh, and my background. My name is Dr. Emily Splickle. I am the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. I am a podiatrist. I'm a clinician, um, but I much more identify myself as a movement specialist, a fitness professional, um, much more of a functional podiatrist versus that very conventional Western medicine for what is isolated. So just know that the lens that I'm speaking of is very much one of a functional perspective. Why I'm so passionate about gait and why we focus a lot on um, from the ground uh, movement efficiency, which of course is going to involve walking, is because that's the most functional move that we're doing every day. I learned gait assessment and uh, the biomechanics of gait from the foot, so that's my, my heavy kind of passion. However, we know that the body is very much integrated, so we cannot think about the gait just as how the foot is interacting with the ground. There's definitely a lot that's happening up approximately, especially when we start focusing on the lumbar spine. So we're going to be looking at that. This is a lead-in to the Barefoot Training Specialist Level 3 course. So please know, think of this as a teaser. This is not uh, an all-inclusive um, from start to finish assessment and programming because at the end I don't want you to say, well, how come you didn't mention this specific muscle or that fascial line? So please know that this is just more of a journey of exploration that we're going to take together. Okay, so our sponsor for this webinar is Pedestal Footwear, which is actually a uh, barefoot, uh, quote unquote barefoot, think of it much more as a lifting sock. So when you have a client or you yourself or you're in a facility that you cannot be completely barefoot, whether that's for liability reasons, uh, sterility reasons, personal preference, you still want to get into the most bare or minimal environment as possible. The pedestal footwear lifting sock is a perfect way to do that. It is reinforced with silver, so it has an impregnated uh, silver, which is antimicrobial. It's reinforced along the arch to give you a little bit of support there. Um, and it has uh, some grip or traction, so you won't be sliding around in your socks like a lot of uh, traditional socks may have. So just know that we are raffling two pairs, so I will be asking you two questions throughout this webinar to win a pair of the pedestal socks. And I've lifted in them already. They are definitely, um, you can 
get better traction, you can engage short foot, so you can maintain that foot to core sequencing, which we are so passionate about at EBFA. So we are going to get started. So why I'm taking a uh, recent look at the evolution of the foot and ankle, the evolution of bipedal locomotion, the evolution of lumbar lordosis, is it really helps you understand uh, function, it helps you understand biomechanics, and it also really helps you understand dysfunction and compensation patterns. That's really why I like understanding the evolution, is I use it much more towards the diagnosis of compensation and dysfunction. So when we look at the evolution of uh, Homo sapien from the primate, from the ape, what we saw in the ape, which is clearly not a bipedal uh, animal, it does walk, so it does go on its two hind feet, but what's very characteristic about the uh, primate walking gait when they're on their hind legs is that they're maintaining a bent knee and bent hip position. This is a very inefficient position. Their center of gravity is not situated directly over their hips, so they're recruiting their muscles a little bit more than they should be. They're working a little bit harder to maintain that balance, and clearly that's going to affect their stride length and their speed. So when we think of the primates, the African ape is unable to create that lordotic curvature in the lumbar spine. Therefore, in order to maintain that upright stance, they must bend at the knee and hip. So from an evolution perspective, for us as upright beings, to maintain our center of gravity in the position that it needs to be, we had to create and evolve to have this lumbar lordosis that's critical to the way that we maintain our center of gravity. It also makes the homo sapien very susceptible to low back pain. So a lot of our stress and the enhanced lumbar lordosis and possible shearing spondylolisthesis of the lumbar spine, all of that is very characteristic of the Homo sapien, and it's directly related to our evolution for bipedal locomotion. So as much as it's a benefit, it also gives us these unique injury patterns that we are susceptible for. So when we think about lumbar lordosis, is obviously our lumbar spine is, and our pelvis is going through this anterior tilt and the posterior tilt. The average lumbosacral angle that we want or that is um, kind of that ideal position would be roughly 30 degrees. Now this has a range, and this definitely can range between men and women. When I was looking at the research for this webinar, um, found some great research on lumbar lordosis in women and why women have a little bit more enhanced lumbar lordosis is that women actually create their lordotic curvature over three vertebrae, whereas men create their lumbar lordotic curvature over two vertebrae. And the reason of why this is from an evolutionary perspective has to do with pregnancy and either carrying uh, the fetus during pregnancy, but also carrying the baby after pregnancy. And when you think of the evolution uh, kind of caveman way of thinking of things is the females did not just hang out and take care of the baby. They had to take the baby everywhere while they were doing a lot of these survival um, activities that they had to do. So they couldn't kind of leave the baby. baby had to come with them, which means that they were carrying extra weight, typically to the anterior aspect of their center of gravity, which created increased stress on the lumbar curvature and the lumbar lordosis. So women do have a little bit more flexibility. Um, when you think of certain sports that emphasize lumbar lordosis, such as gymnastics, uh, when you are actively doing gymnastics, so throughout your, your younger years all the way to teenage years, you are able to do a lot of very stressful activities to the lumbar spine and you don't necessarily experience low back pain. However, the rate of low back pain in former gymnasts is exceptionally high because what happens is they start to lose the neuromuscular coordination of what's called force closure and stabilization of the pelvis and that lordotic curvature. So the neuromuscular coordination of certain activities is obviously very important to control this lumbar lordosis. So 
Human bipedalism, huge thing here. We know that walking is a series of falls. That's really what it is. When I teach my level two certification, that's a huge thing that we want to emphasize. Essentially, the body is just falling. You're striking the ground. You're getting one to 1.5 times your body weight in impact coming through. It's a very jarring uh, impact that is coming into your body, which must then be dissipated and absorbed and then you actually use those impact forces to take your next step. So it's this little dance that you're doing back and forth with the ground and with the loading and unloading of potential energy which is via our fascial lines. So gait is highly, highly dependent on your fascial slings. So if you are not familiar with the different fascial lines, I highly encourage you to start exploring those. Uh, whether you're looking at anatomy trains, um, and going under the Thomas Myers myofascial lines, Robert Schleip is another uh, fascial researcher who I follow his work, it's incredible. But just know that the efficiency of bipedalism is to very, be at a very, very low economic expenditure. We don't want to be putting a lot of energy out. From a survival perspective, you can't be putting a lot of energy out, otherwise you obviously would not survive. Another thing as far as human bipedalism is not only do you need to absorb those impact forces, but the way that you absorb those impact forces through these different rotations throughout the body have to somehow be what's called decoupled or dissipated so that your head and your eyes stay very, very stable. So all of the action is happening neck down. All those rotations are being decoupled, all that impact, so that your head, your brain, your eyes are staying very stable. That's something also that's very, very important. And then, of course, stride. If we want to be quick. If we're going to survive, especially think like caveman period, you have to be quick, which means you have to have very long strides. Another thing as far as females and lumbar uh, lordosis with the female pelvis, I thought this was also very interesting, is that women's strides, if you take the same leg length of a female, so their femur relative to a, a man who has the exact same femur length, their strides, a female stride is actually longer because we, females, we, have a increased lordotic potential which I thought was quite fascinating. So when we look at the different rotations of the pelvis, please know that those are directly related to the lumbar curvature. If you do not have that lumbar lordosis and that lumbar curvature, you would not be able to rotate the pelvis in the way that you need for an efficient gait, for a long stride. So women have uh, some of that advantage, in a sense. So when we look at the Neanderthal, this is really fascinating to see the way that our pelvis is different than the Neanderthal pelvis. And a lot of um, kind of the evolution, if you just Google Neanderthal and human and pelvis, you will see there's several articles that talk about could the Neanderthal beat the current Homo sapien? Could they keep up with the agility and the quickness of the human or the Homo sapien that we know today? And a lot of the argument is no. <laughs> because of their pelvis, their pelvic curvature, and a lot of changes in the ilium and the ischium and the femoral angle that we're going to go into as far as what creates the current pelvis and lumbar curvature that we know today. So when you think of the Neanderthal, which is the picture on the left, compared to the Homo sapien, is they have a reduced stride length. Remember what allows you to have a very long stride is the rotations of the pelvis. Now when I say rotations of the pelvis, please know that this is three-dimensional rotations. So I'm not just referencing anterior, posterior tilts, etc. So you need to have three-dimensional rotation of your pelvis to have a sufficient or a uh, lengthened stride length. They also will have a decreased walking velocity because of that velocity is also controlled and the potential energy and impact forces are controlled through the three-dimensional rotations of the pelvis. They would maintain a little bit more of a bent hip and bent knee gait, which is very inefficient. So it costs a lot of energy. It's a very um, high cost, high economic cost to do a bent hip, bent knee gait.
Also, they would be leaning their chest forward, which we know is just a compensation of somehow controlling that center of mass. Very inefficient if you put that all together versus the modern human. So when we start looking at the pelvis and the shape of the pelvis, the picture here on the left, that's going to be, that's a chimpanzee's uh, pelvis and femur angle, whereas the one in the center here, that would be more along the lines of the Neanderthal pelvis, and then this would be the Homo sapien on the right. Some of the big differences that we see here with the chimpanzee, I'm going to show you another picture soon, but the ilium of the chimpanzee pelvis actually faces in the frontal plane. So it's flat with the anterior posterior, whereas in the Homo sapien, it is rotated so that the iliac crest and kind of the flat border of the ilium is actually facing out laterally. So it's not just in this sagittal plane direction, but now we actually have this frontal plane. And when we start thinking about frontal plane ba uh, balance of the hips and the pelvis, we know that the glute medius and minimus is going to come into play. That's really why the ilium started to create this curvature is because we had to balance the hip in the frontal plane or the pelvis in the frontal plane during bipedal locomotion and during the single leg stance of the bipedal locomotion. Also going to have a flatter lordotic curvature. Actually, in the chimpanzee or the ape, they have no lordotic curvature. Um, however, in the Neanderthal, they have less of a lordotic curvature than the Homo sapien. The advantage of this, think of this with the uh, female and pregnancy and the issues that women go through when they're carrying the weight of their, of their fetus is the stress that that places on the lumbar curvature. With the Neanderthal, they were able, their body was designed to carry heavy loads, not for distances like Homo sapien, it's much more to carry heavy loads. For them to not have a lordotic curvature, that was an advantage. However, if you're going to start being much more mobile and fast, you then have to switch the ability to carry heavy load with the ability to take longer strides, dissipate impact, create these rotations. Okay, so very important. As far as looking at the human ilium and the human pelvis, we see this medial rotation of the ilium, which places the glutes superior to the acetabulum. So now they're controlling the abduction, adduction of the hip. And then the femoral acetabulum is embedded into the pelvic outlet. That's very, very important as far as the control of that hip joint and really the ability to circumduct the hip is what that created that advantage. So here, this picture, I think this is totally fascinating that you can see the flatness, this right here, the picture on the right, that flatness of the ilium in the more primitive ape, chimpanzee, etc. You can then see, and I'll, kind of, I'll show you a picture in a moment, as far as the uh, hip extension is going to be the primary purpose of controlling that lumbar spine and the pelvis. Whereas here in the human uh, Homo sapien, we see that rotation, which again puts the glutes a little bit more superior. Another thing that I want you to note is here, if you see where these arrows are, do you see how the ischial tuberosity has changed the direction, which means that that's going to change the direction of pull of the sacral tuberous ligament, which is going to control the SI joint. When we look at the SI joints in a moment, we're going to look at the very important role that having that ischial tuberosity sitting in the position that it is improves the efficiency of force closure and stabilization of the SI joint upon heel strike. Very important. Last thing that I want to note is you can see the very robust iliac crest, and that is, again, for muscle attachment. These muscles that attach here play a very important role in bipedal locomotion, which is very different than here where it is flat, and they don't have that robust iliac crest. Very important difference to note. Again, had mentioned here with the abductory role of the gluteus medius, it was that rotation and kind of that fanning out to the lateral side, and then that brings the glutes a little bit higher as well. Rotation of the ilium allows lumbar lordosis and a more vertically sitting SI joint. The SI joint is also going to be then stabilized based on that rotation 
and enlargement of the ischial tuberosity, which again gives a biomechanical fascial tension benefit to the bicep femoris and the posterior chain during heel strikes. So the way that we're stabilizing the SI joint during heel strike is very much dictated on that evolutionary enlargement of the ischial tuberosity. So, I already mentioned this, right, ischial tuberosity, the rotation, very, very important, great, okay? This is a picture here, you can see that this ape has absolutely no lordotic curvature, and when they, if you were to bring the chest up of this primate, that they would have to maintain the bent knee and the bent hip position. You can also note the flatness. So right here, if you were to look at like the gorilla, the ape, the chimpanzee, at their glutes, their glutes played a very important role in hip extension. That's really what they were designed for. Whereas in the human with the bipedal locomotion, now our glutes are playing a very important role in the abduction frontal plane balance of the hip key, key, key when it comes to bipedal locomotion and the single leg stance. So as far as SI joint stability, there's two terms that you want to know, and I'll mention these again when it goes with the pelvic rotations, is the nutation and counter-nutation. This has to do with the torsion of the pelvis and the opposing torsion of the pelvis, which stabilizes the SI joint during bipedal locomotion. If you have any clients who do have SI joint pain, you want to be looking at the way that you're at the way that they're walking, but you also want to think about the three-dimensional rotations of the pelvis as well as the trunk. And if there's any break within those rotations when you're seeing them walk, that that's where you're going to want to fix it. A lot of that has to do with the timing, so the neuromuscular coordination of these fascia lines, which I also speak tons about in the Barefoot Training Specialist Certification, is the demands of gait is based on the neuromuscular coordination of your fascia lines, and is also dictated on the ability of your nervous system to anticipate foot contact. So a lot of what we go into typically with the foot contact and the fascial tensioning translates all the way up to the SI joint stability, which is dictated through that bicep femoris. So bicep femoris is going to continue all the way down into our spiral line. So for those who have taken my program and you know how we speak about the spiral line, you can start to connect the dots of how it's going to influence different structures proximally. So, it is time for a pair of pedestal footwear. So, again, make sure that you look at your control panel. There is a questions tab. You're going to want to type this in if you have your correct answer. All right, so every step we take, the pelvis rotates to store tr and transfer potential energy. How are these rotations of the pelvis countered as to keep the head and eye stable? So what is countering the rotations of the pelvis? The first person who types in the correct answer wins a pair of free pedestal footwear lifting socks, which are pretty awesome. They're impregnated in silver. They have grips. They have a little bit of an arch support built into them. They are pretty awesome. Not the glutes. Good guess. Again, what counters the rotation of the pelvis? We need to see a decoupling that is help happening throughout the entire body. What is allowing the head to stay stable while the pelvis is rotating? It's not the glutes. It's not the sacrum. It's not the obliques. You're getting closer. So, very good guess. Excellent here. So, Irv Rubenstein. Good job. It is from the counter rotation of the upper body, specifically the thoracic spine, with the arm movements. Good job. So we must have that thoracic spine, T-spine counter rotation to oppose the rotations of the pelvis. If we did not have that, then we would obviously start to see rotations up into the cervical spine and up into the head. So great job. Thoracic counter rotation. So 
proceeding forward, our lumbar lordosis, essentially you could say that it kind of like unlocks the pelvis, allowing pelvic mobility that is needed for bipedal locomotion. Lumbar lordosis allows us to increase our stride length. Lumbar lordosis allows us to increase our speed, and it, and it of course, is going to allow us to improve our efficiency. First rotation that we're going to look at is the transverse plane. So when or how your pelvis is rotating in the transverse plane is it's going to follow the stepping leg. So the swing leg that as it's coming forward, if you're taking a step with your right foot, or here we'll do it with our left foot because that's what the model's doing. If you're taking a step with your left foot, your pelvis is going to rotate towards the swing or towards the back leg. So. We are here, pelvis is rotating this way towards the open leg. So you could think of it as whatever arm is going to come forward, the pelvis is going to rotate towards that arm. If you are quite familiar with the different uh, functional lines, you could see the way that this is going to start creating tension in your functional lines. So right leg steps forward, right pelvis is going to rotate towards the left side of the body, left arm goes forward and we know that there's going to be a thoracic rotation towards the right side of the body. Very important rotation which is going to prime for the elastic recoil of the potential energy. So this decoupling with thoracic rotation is obviously going to tap into these functional lines, Design for energy transfer. There is something that is called the spine engine. If you want to explore more on this, I highly recommend being familiar with what is referred to as the spine engine. The spinal engine theory is pretty much based on the fact that um, you don't really need legs to walk, that it's just the pelvis and the thoracic spine that's doing these rotations and that is allowing. Uh, us to go from point A to point B. The biggest comparative that supports that is if you see someone who doesn't have legs and the, they're walking on their ischium or their ischial tuberosity that they are still able to ambulate because of the pelvis rotations and the decoupled rotations through the thoracic spine. Um, that's again spinal engine, huge, huge, huge element to understand when it comes to Gait. This decoupling with the thoracic rotation allows the head and the eyes to stay stable and that decoupling should occur at T-spine 8. If it is not happening at T-spine 8 and you do not have that freedom of range of motion, then obviously you are going to lose that decoupling and that rotation is going to go a little bit higher up, most likely into your cervical spine. So. Thoracic rotation is how you decouple the pelvis rotation. This is a great example. I love, love, love this example as far as the all of this decoupling and all of this action should be happening from the neck down. So your head is staying very stable. Think of it almost like analogous to a hummingbird and how the wings are going very, very fast thousands of times uh, a minute, yet the precision of when they're going into the flower to get the pollen is so controlled and so precise despite the body moving and the wings moving the way that they are. That is a perfect example of the decoupling that we need in our body as well during bipedal locomotion. Head stays stable, the rest of the body is doing the loading and unloading of potential energy and that decoupling. When we look at the pelvis in the frontal plane, this is where we're going to see that lateral tilt or lateral, lateral drop. You're going to see a 5 degrees in the frontal plane. The drop of the pelvis is always in the direction of the swing leg. So if you are swinging your right leg through and you pick up your right leg, your pelvis is going to drop 5 degrees to the right side. That's obviously going to engage your left gluteus medius, which is going to pull that hip back up and resist an excessive pelvic tilt. This is also countered with a lateral trunk lean and your lateral trunk lean goes towards the direction of your leg. So pelvic tilt goes to the swing leg, lateral trunk lean goes towards your stance leg and that is happening simultaneously. You can see this from this picture on the um, 
left of how that is loading your myofascial tissue and again it's designed for energy transfer. This assessment here on the right, this is a way that you could assess and you can do this on your clients if you're somewhere and you have a, a partner that you can do right now. Great assessment that I found in the book Born to Walk by James Earl. Again, highly recommend this book, Born to Walk, Myofascial Efficiency and the Body in Movement, James Earls. Completely written around the myofascial lines and anatomy train, so if you already look at movement that way, check out this book, it is great. So, if you are standing with your feet shoulder width apart, or sorry, feet a little bit closer, feet together, and then you are going to bend one knee, just like what this uh, model is doing in the picture. She's bending one knee, as you should see the hip drop, so on the left one, she's, she's bending her right side, and then her body is leaning to the left. Now the lumbar level that this should be happening, this pelvic tilt is L3. So the thoracic rotation that is decoupling the pelvic rotation, the transverse plane, is going to be T8. And then as far as the level of the pelvic tilt, lateral trunk lean, that decoupling that we're seeing should be happening at L3. You want to do that bilateral and obviously see that they can create that lateral trunk lean. When it comes to lateral trunk lean, this is very much uh, exaggerated in people who do not have controlled lumbar lordosis. Maybe they have a, um, a flat back syndrome, so they don't have that lordotic curvature. Remember, once the lordotic curvature goes, then your pelvic, three-dimensional pelvic rotations go. The way that they walk, and I'm sure you've seen uh, seen this in some people, even like an intelligent gait, is that they emphasize their lateral trunk lean. That's really how Neanderthal uh, primates walk, is they have a very exaggerated lateral trunk lean, and that's how they're getting their body to move, because they can't take those rotations out of the pelvis due to the lack of lumbar lordosis. So lateral trunk lean should be a small degree, and it's directly proportional to the pelvic tilt. So you want those to be happening at L3, so that's a great test to do. Last pelvic rotation that we're going to look at is our torsion. Now this is where we start looking at SI joint stability and the nutation, counter nutation as far as how we stabilize um, the SI joint. So when it comes to the sagittal plane, when you're swinging your right leg forward, you're about to take a step with your right leg, so you're entering uh, right before heel strike on your right leg, your pelvis on the right side is in a posture tilt. The left leg, which is the leg that's now in late mid stance, kind of starting to enter into the propulsive phase, is going to be in an anterior tilt. So right side is in a posture tilt, left side is in an anterior tilt, and you create a torsion within your pelvis. What's restricting that torsion within the pelvic is your pubic symphysis, and the ligaments of your SI joints. You're creating stability. Because the swing leg that you're swinging forward is going into that posture tilt, you could envision how you are lengthening the hamstrings and the posture chain and the sacral tuberous ligament with the hamstrings. So now it's pulling straight down and you get that forced closure slash stabilization of your SI joint before, it must must be before your heel strikes the ground. A lot of people who get SI joint pain do not have that nutation, torsion of their pelvis, which means they don't have enough fascial tensioning upon heel strike. Those impact forces then clearly are going to go into the SI joint. Very important role of the SI joint is to dissipate ground reaction forces centered around the lower back and the lumbar spine. So do know that a lot of that can definitely have to do with your deep front line and the sequencing of the deep front line with the spiral line and the lateral line so just know that we need to be able to have this torsion leg that's swinging forward posterior tilt leg that is behind should be in that anterior tilt so when we look at stride length and hip extension what's allowing us to take these increased uh, steps that differentiated us from the 
uh, Neanderthal and from the primates, that stride length is not just coming from hip extension. We have about 10 to 12 degrees of true, true hip extension. What's also involved in that, and we can see from the picture here, is that we have roughly three to seven degrees of an anterior tilt. The leg that is behind, right here he is in propulsive phase of stance phase on that left leg, is also in an anterior tilt. So he's extended, he's in an anterior tilt, so that's getting him a greater stride. And then he is also rotating laterally. So his left pelvis is opening up towards the left side. Remember that the left arm is going in, so the trunk is going in. The right pelvis is going towards that left arm, which means that left pelvis is rotating open towards the left side. That opening of the hip, the anterior of the, uh, the pelvis, and then the hip extension is allowing for the increased stride length. So a few things that I want you to think about as far as these pelvic rotations is how can, if we were to take this from a uh, top-down approach, how could these pelvic rotations influence or be influenced by the foot? Or do those pelvic rotations influence our foot function during gait? We want to be timing the three-dimensional rotations of the pelvis with the subtalar and first ray medial column stability of the foot. So the ability to lock and unlock the foot for bipedal locomotion has to obviously be timed with the different three-dimensional pelvic rotations. Clearly we're going to start seeing that if there is a dysfunction in one of these fascial lines that it's going to affect um, all the way up. The next question that I'm going to go into for our pedestal footwear uh, is going to kind of test you guys, see how much you know on this, and then I'll go into the answer as far as that question. So, which muscle, actually I had a completely different question, I'm sorry. <laughs> which muscle of the deep front line contains an anterior and posterior septum, allowing the deep front line to be active in both hip flexion and hip extension? Which muscle of the deep front line contains the anterior and posterior septum, allowing the deep, line, deep front line to be active in both hip flexion and hip extension? Got some good guesses, but we are not there yet. Keep guessing. It is not the psoas. It is not the gracilis. It is not the TBA. It is not the QL. Muscles of the deep front line. Who wants the pair of pedestal footwear? Socks, good socks, lifting socks. Not the iliacus. Ooh, you're getting close. Andrew, I will give it to you. You are very close. Very close. Pectinius is what Andrew Wheatley answered. The correct answer is the adductors. So you have an anterior septum to your adductors, which does include your pectineus. This is how you get your adductors and your deep front line to get up into your psoas, your QL, your iliacus. And then the posterior adductor septum is what gets our adductors into your obturator internus and into your pelvic floor. So we have our deep front line playing a very important role in both hip flexion and hip extension, which means when it comes to bipedal locomotion and the fascial lines, we always want our deep front line to fire before the other fascial lines. Something that we also emphasize in the BTS program is that we always want our local stabilizers to fire before our global stabilizers or global mobilizers. So in our EBFA program, we target getting the deep front line to be that initial myofascial highway that we need to sequence. So if we take the example of, and this will kind of hit it home with the foot, if we take the example of the SI joint pain upon heel strike. Let's say you have a client, and what you're noticing is we have um, an everted overpronated foot. As soon as we have an overpronated foot, your foot becomes very unlocked and unstable. 
as soon as you unlock your foot and you even start to throw off and you actually put the peroneus longus tendon at a mechanical disadvantage, which means now your entire spiral line is put at a disadvantage. Our spiral line is going to lead all the way up into your bicep femoris, which is going to play a very important role in the way that you are stabilizing that SI joint. If you want to think of this as well as our uh, deep front line, if your foot is unlocked and unstable, you're not going to be able to tap into your posture tibialis and your flexors, which means your pelvic floor and your deep rotators are not going to be stable. So then upon foot strike, you're not going to get that spiral line to fire as well. So in the uh, client who has SI joint pain, upon heel strike, and has an overpronated, unlocked foot, I would start with a lot of the pro foot programming that we already do, which includes uh, short foot, foot to core sequencing, diaphragmatic breathing, pelvic floor activation. So we're doing all of that foot to core, which is the foundation. However, if we build on what we were focusing in this webinar with the rotations, is I would want to make sure that this client has those three dimensional. So are they able to rotate the pelvis in that transverse plane? Can they get that pelvic obliquity? Can they do that lateral tilts and other gluteus medius working? Great, great. Primary one that I want to focus on though is the nutation ability of the pelvis, which would be that opposing anterior tilt on the extended leg and posterior tilt on the swing leg. When you get that, that's primarily what is stabilizing the SI joint. That would be a way to start increasing this. If you have any clients, and the way that uh, I start seeing this in my patients is patients who have absolutely no thoracic rotation, which means that when they are walking, the decoupling that we need to see happening and not just the decoupling but the fascial loading and unloading with every step that they are taking is not happening. So they're not getting that rubber band effect of their functional lines whether it's the swinging across or the way that the pelvis is rotating towards that um, thoracic spine when they're taking a step forward. So. Um, Again, I want you to start exploring the way that the uh, lumbar curvature allows the three-dimensional pelvic rotations. If you are currently doing gait assessment and you're thinking of it uh, purely as far as how the foot interacts with the ground, that is awesome. That's a very complex way. That's the way that we teach it in a level two. But I want you to start looking at the pelvis and thinking of the thoracic spine and the pelvic rotations and what that's doing from an energy transfer standpoint just as much as what's happening down at the foot with the supination and pronation because those have to be timed and it's clearly sequenced. I did not go into anything with the fascia lines because one, we only have so much time and it's already 9.45 and two, I want you to start exploring this concept of pelvic rotations and understand the important role of lumbar lordosis. We don't want to be getting into um, too extreme. I think that some of the uh, popular workouts that emphasize too much of a posture tilt and a flattening of the lumbar spine could be very deleterious to bipedal locomotion and really the way that our fascial system is supposed to load and unload. Um, you're kind of fighting natural evolution of the um, spine and pelvis and as far as um, assessments is key ones that we went into is understanding that that decoupled rotation is happening at the level of T-spine 8 and then as far as the pelvic tilt and the lateral flexion is that is happening around the lumbar 3. If you have any questions please let me know. 
please consider this as an exploration and a journey to start understanding GATE from a more proximal perspective, which I want you to combine to your understanding of GATE in a from the ground up perspective. Once we master both proximal and distal, then you can start to look at some heavy myofascial sequencing and the way that one is going to influence the other. If you have any questions, please type those in. If not, please know that we have our Barefoot Training Summit in New York City coming up. We have some amazing presenters. You can see that we have some amazing sponsors. We have Dr. Perry Nicholson of Stop Chasing Pain. We have Chris Flo of Animal Flow. He's going to do some movement. Dan Edwards of Parkour Generations is going to be talking about barefoot landing and jumping techniques. Uh, Rad Roller is going to be there. Pedestal Footwear is going to be there, of course. Michelle Dalcourt. No comments mentioned on that one because he's just fabulous. Uh, we have Stick Mobility is going to be doing a session. Stacey Lee Krauss, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, fascial tensioning in the body weight athlete. We have a special 10% discount if you enter the code SUMMIT. That is good for 24 hours. So if you want to take advantage of that, please do that soon. For those who won the pedestal footwear, please do um, email me at education at EBFA Fitness, education at EBFA Fitness, and we'll make sure that we get you your uh, pedestal socks. And if you want a copy of this PowerPoint or any of the references, also email me at education at ebfafitness.com. All right, so let's take a look. Question is, do you find more people have restrictions at the L3 joint for lateral flexion or at the T8 joint rotation? Are there any key tips for teaching these movements or releasing these restrictions? Um, I don't know if it's just in my experience or in my office. I'm sure some of the listeners would be able to uh, chime in as far as what they see more. I personally see much more uh, limitations in T-spine rotation, so thoracic rotation. Um, there's a lot of different exercises. There's different sideline ones that you can do to increase thoracic rotation. Different yoga poses increase the thoracic rotation. Um, I find that that one is uh, a lot more common and it has to be addressed almost every day where I practice in Manhattan. So most of my patients, and I think that this is a huge contributor that you should think of, majority of my patients, um, Manhattan carrying a bag, for anyone who also is in a city where people commute and they just carry the bag everywhere, if you're carrying a bag on one side and you're actually holding the bag with your arm and you're only moving, you're only swinging one arm, think about what that's doing to your thoracic rotation. You also want to think about what that's doing to your QLs because you're trying to control the lateral flexion of the back. So both lateral flexion, pelvic tilt, and T-spine rotation are compromised when you are carrying kind of like a commuter bag uh, or whatnot. So I don't know if that's why I see a lot of um, thoracic rotation issues is because of kind of carrying heavy bags. Um, but that's much more of what I see, and it's something that in my earlier years I didn't address as much because it's not emphasized in gait assessment that we learn as a podiatrist. We really look at just the foot, which is um, not good, very incomplete. So now I make it a key feature of my gait assessments with my patients to assess and to incorporate thoracic spine mobility and give them tips that they can do on a daily basis for improving the thoracic rotation. Um, in your experience, how would you train the plantar fascia musculature to increase the stability of the arch? I was at the ACS meeting last week um, and heard some of the PTs from Harvard, Spalding, such as, oh, I can't again. Sorry, I lost my mouse. Um, sorry, Irv, I can't get to the rest of your question. My mouse has disappeared. <laughs> okay. Oh, found it. Okay. Uh, Spalding is training as domain. Yes, yes. So the exercise that I use, Irv, that's a great question, is I actually call it short foot. 
Short put is an exercise that was introduced by Dr. Yanda. If you go to the EBFA YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash EBFA Fitness, there's a playlist that's called Run Injury Free. Under that, you will see a video that is called Short Foot. You will see several other exercises that are post-tib exercises. Essentially, what you want to go after is the posterior tibialis, the abductor hallucis, uh, the glutes, and the deep front line. Those are the muscles that you want to go after and the fascia lines that you want to go after for increasing the medial arch. This is not going to work in every single foot, but in a majority of feet, even those feet that need orthotics, will benefit from short foot and post hip strengthening, deep front line strengthening. Do you recommend minimalist shoes for those with spinal injuries? Um, if they are not able to decouple the impact forces and control the pelvic rotations, or perhaps out of uh, past injuries, their pelvis is completely locked down, then the concern with minimal shoes is that they may, if they're not in tune with the foot, may be taking in higher impact than uh, is normal. So I would make sure that you are doing barefoot training, proprioceptive training, uh, an awareness to how the foot perceives the ground, uh, what I call pre-activation training, so that your gateway of information coming in is ready to take an impact because the pelvic rotations are compromised that they may, na may not be able to dissipate or stabilize against higher impact forces. That's really why cushion shoes are recommended in people who have SI joint pain, low back pain, spine injuries, etc. is because it's trying to take some of that impact because they've lost their ability to decouple these, these uh, impact forces. So um, I'd say Yes and no. It depends. You just have to make sure that you're doing appropriate training for um, for that client that has some sort of spinal issue or pelvic rotation issue and is doing the minimal shoes. Um, about the foot position and angulation and its relation to pelvic muscles. If the foot is loaded at a certain angle, could impact in different muscles. Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question, Martin. Um, as far as the foot position and the angulation in relation to pelvic muscles, are you referencing if your gait is a little bit more abducted, adducted, if the foot is internally rotated, externally rotated? Um, if you could just provide a little bit more information. And, sorry, going into, keep losing my mouse. All right. Uh, Martin, if you could let me know that. If not, and you want to just email me, you can do that as well, because I think that's probably a very um, in-depth question. Uh, if there are no other questions, then um, please let me know if you want the PDF, education at ebfafitness.com. Otherwise, check out the recordings, youtube.com, and then as far as... Um, Checking out the Barefoot Training Summit, please do so at barefoottrainingsummit.com. Use the code SUMMIT to get 10% off. Thank you guys so much. The next webinar that we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at gait, but we're going to be looking a little bit closer at these fascia lines. Another webinar that I want to do uh, very soon is the embryology uh, of the foot, which is a little bit different than evolution. Embryology is uh, really the torsional rotations that are happening in the tibia and in the femur, and uh, how is it that your Achilles tendon has this counter rotation from like in, as each egg is dis dividing, so um, or each cell is dividing. That would be much more the embryology. So do know that we have great webinars coming up. Have a great night, and if it is morning where you are, have a great day. Take care, you guys.